Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the songs that were sung, the prayers that have been prayed. Father, we just want to honor you and thank you for your spirit even being in with us right now. We thank you that we have this opportunity to come together. And there's no put, no edict against us gathering. There's no one standing at the door to make sure that we're saying what the government wants us to say, but that we're free and able to walk into liberty wherewith you have made us free. So, Father, we just want to thank you for an opportunity to stand before your people, for an opportunity for your people to gather together, for us to look into your word and get a greater understanding of your love towards us and how you want that love to be reflected through us. So we thank you and honor you for this. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We are on part number two of our home series. And last week when we talked about it, we, I, I brought up the fact that there's a difference between a house and a home. And I'm not talking about Luther's version. <laughs> I'm just talking about the fact is there's a difference between a house and a home. We have learned, uh, also I want to just, all, all the veterans and those that have served in the military for at least a day, you are now a veteran, so we just want to acknowledge your service to the country. Less than 1% of the population of the United States serves in the military, so we just definitely want to salute you for making that decision. Thank you so much. But one of the things that you learn that in the military is you end up having two homes. You have a home when you're deployed, and then you have a home when you're at your house. And the philosophy of home that is different from a house is a home is your point of safety, your point of family, where I can be with those folks that care about me and that I care about. That's what a home is. A house is something that has been constructed, put together, but the home comes by the folks that are in there and the spirit by which that house is filled. And so we want to talk about home, and as you can see, it's a series about family. I believe this is a very important time for us to talk about this series because some of us are inviting folks over to our homes for the holiday season, either Thanksgiving or Christmas. And we want to have a different type of atmosphere. We want when folks walk into our house this time to them for them to feel something different. We want them to know that God is doing something in this house. We want them to feel that this is the place, this is the feeling that I want to have when I walk into my own house. It just feels like I, I can be here and I can be myself here and I'm safe here. That's the type of mentality that we want folks to have and feel when they walk into our home. So last week we had to start at the foundation. The foundation of the home is the husband and the wife. And we talked about how they have to work together. And we're going to talk later on, not, not in the series, but later on, because we're, on, we're doing a Bible study through the book, a book, a Bible survey through the book of Ephesians. But we're going to talk about how we seem to have forgot, well, we seem to remember that wives are supposed to submit to their husband, but we forgot to look a verse up and say that we're supposed to submit to one another. So, so, you know, we got some little, little what they call that, selective listening going on. <laughs> but we want to operate in the power of unity, submitting one to another that we are, as we heard um, um, Clive say, we want to exalt someone higher than ourselves. We don't want to think higher of ourselves, but we want to exalt everyone around us. You know what I discovered? If you start making everybody else around you happy, it just creates a happy environment. Amen. If you start looking out for other people, it makes the environment change. Mm -hmm. 
But if you try to make your own self happy, it doesn't have the same <laughs> potentiality to affect others. But when we start speaking life into other people, it causes the whole environment to change. So last week, as I said, we talked about couples. So guess what we're going to talk about this? We're going to talk about families. I don't need you to guess. I'm going to tell you. We're going to talk about families this week. We're going to talk about how the world needs to see a healthy family, a loving family that live out the power of God in the family. Now, I'm not saying that everybody in the family is living godly. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they have a reverence for God by which folks can see there's something different about that entire family. Now, that one is a knucklehead. <laughs> but he, it seemed to be, I ain't know it was such thing, but it's a good knucklehead. He has respect. You know, he does those things that cause you to say there's something special about that family. I talked about you always had that one house when I was growing up on every street. And the house that we had happened to be on Home Avenue. <laughs> and it was right at the corner, so we had a nice little pole we played hide and seek. You had that place where you could be it and everything. And <laughs> the house was just in a perfect location. Everybody would gather at that house. And that's where we'd have fun. That was back in the days when you would turn on the faucet outside and just put your lips all on the faucet and drink the water. <laughs> y'all so sterile and sanitized today, y'all would y'all would y'all probably have a swab to wipe the y'all no, y'all wouldn't even do that. Y'all would y'all go to the store and buy a bottle of water and then we talking about y'all gonna get sick. But anyway <laughs> I'm sorry, I digressed for a moment. I, I had a flashback. But anyway, so as we look at how important those, those beacons are, those homes are, where everybody knew that we could go and have fun, and um, the mom would be there, and she would be like, she'd be, end up becoming everybody's mom. Because when y'all having fun, guess what? You do have some disagreements and some... Uh, I won't say fights, but... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You get some tension going. And this, 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 she'd come out there and she had this little high pitched voice and she'd be like, What y'all doing? <laughs> you know, and so I ain't gonna say no name because she see this, I don't want her getting on me. But uh, let's look at the scriptures that we're gonna do for today. We're gonna go to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. And I would love for you to read that whole fifth chapter. And I'm going to kind of bounce around between the 6th and the 23rd verses to kind of bring out some points that I believe that we need to grab hold of to have that family that, it, that is showing what the life of Christ should look like in a family. There's some couples hurt. There's some children hurting because mom and dad are hurting. We have discovered through research that hurt people are like to hurt people. And I don't mean like as in they take enjoyment in it. It is their way of communicating because that's the only way of communicating that they know. And so we want to provide an environment where folks can see you don't have to do it that way. And what you went through was not good, but we don't have to perpetuate that. As we talked about in the offering, matter of fact, remember we said, talked about setting up legacy. We started talking about how if we start establishing a pattern, a level of discipline of doing things that will affect your children's children's children. It works positively as well as negatively. That is why we're hearing a lot of a lot of uh, now about how we have discovered that women's lib was not an issue. We wanted our women to have liberty. 
But the problem became when the women said they didn't need men. <laughs> because that was not how God set it up. God said he created man, he created woman, and they shall leave their mother and father, and they shall become one flesh. The whole premise behind civilization is this, the family. The basic foundation for the civilization is the family. And as you begin to see, if you look throughout history, you see a deterioration of families, the, that basic family unit, it starts causing a ripple effect through the nation. It's happened with the Greeks. It happened with the Phoenicians. It happened with the Romans. It happened with, and it's happening to the United States of America. Because we are not emphasizing how important it is to have that centralized unit that is established on right and righteousness and a good living. Just do what you want to. It's your thing. Mm. That's good. Mm -hmm. We have to go back to establishing the beacon, those foundational things, the family, the husband loving the wife, the wife respecting the husband, then submitting one to another. they showing love to their children through discipline. My mother, for my first three grades of elementary school, and I'm skipping kindergarten, the first three grades of elementary school, my mom, on the first day of school, took me up to the school. She would go in and meet my teacher. And she would say, this is my son Timothy. You have my permission to paddle him if <coughs> he gets out of sorts. My second grade teacher Miss Watson, God rest her soul. Mm -hmm. She's a good teacher, mm -hmm. but she ain't like me. <laughs> she gave me a pallet every day <laughs> in the second grade. When I went on the lab, the day after school was out, and I went to go pick up my grade card, she wanted to paddle me that day. I was a good, I'm telling you, I was good. Mm -hmm. She had issue. I guess she, she said no other parent would allow their kids to get paddled. I got everybody else's paddle. Hmm, yeah. That's my that's my truth and I'm staying with it. Uh, mm -hmm. But my point was this. There, during that time period, there was this if you if you whoop your children or you discipline them, you're going to cause them to have issues when they grow up. I know kids that didn't get whooping that had issues when they grew up. So it wasn't the action, it was the intention behind the action. There's a saying that, that, that my wife uses. She says, rules without relationship, I, I knew it was another R, <laughs> rules without relationship actually lead to rebellion. Mm -hmm. So you have these rules, but you have no relationship. Mm -hmm. All they know is you come into the house to whoop their butt because they can't never do nothing right, and they have no established relationship with you, you end up with the rebellious type children. I'm so far off my notes right now, but I'm having fun. But anyway, let's go to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. And I want us to look, as I said, I, I, I want you to read 7 all the way to 23, but I'm, I'm going to, for the sake of time, I want to go ahead and just point out some couple things real quick. Verse number 8, he says, get caught up. Verse number 8, he says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light, in the Lord, walk as children of light. Hmm. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. We had a discussion in a, in a Bible study is 
There is no such thing necessarily as darkness. Darkness is what we call the absence of light. And so light is what we want to be. Light is what we want to establish because we know in darkness you can't see, you can't function, and it's depressing. Paint a room all black and have somebody living there joking. They'll come out of there so gloomy and because light is what provides light. The process of photosynthesis is based upon light. Photosynthesis is what causes us to have oxygen in the air. Oxygen in the air is what we need to breathe. Breathing is what we need to do to live. So it all has an effect. So as we look at this, we want to do things that cause our family to reflect light and not darkness. But if you just have a bunch of rules and have no relationship, all you want to do is create rebellion. You're going to create an environment where your children will act one way in front of you and another way when they're not in front of you. I was telling a friend of mine, I said, to, if you want to make sure that what you're teaching your kids is actually adhering to your kids, allow them to go do some things without you being around. Mm -hmm. Allow them to go some places without you being around. And then listen for the report. Because when, folk, when, when parents take your kids, <laughs> and your kids ain't good kids, they ain't going to invite them again. Right. <laughs> In fact, the, the, the folks that we were raising our kids, when they come take them, they say, yep, this is what your son, this is what your daughter did. Because we wanted everybody to have good kids. That was our goal. Our goal was to have those good, godly kids. And kids do things. Kids say things. Mm -hmm. But that's why we have to have a relationship with them, whereby to provide them the right direction. Put them on the right course. Because guess what? Michael Jackson had that song said, I always feel like somebody's watching me. I ain't got no privacy. Oh, oh. <laughs> y'all know, know that song? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I just wanted to be sure. Oh, you saying what album it was? Okay. All right. And we're not supposed to have, in verse number 11, it says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Don't be fellowshipping with the darkness. Guess what the darkness do? The darkness will try to take your life because darkness loves light. It's called the law of equilibrium. Like when it's hot outside and you open up your window, that cold and that hot try to balance. And so that's why you can get a little current going, a little wind going, because the air is trying to balance. It's a law of equilibrium. So the light is trying to go to where the darkness is, and the darkness is trying to go where the light is to cause a balance. But we already know that there's no life in the darkness. There's no hope in the darkness. So why do we want to fellowship with hopelessness? Why do we want to fellowship with lifelessness? Because it feels good? Because it causes, it causes too much work to be in the light? Why? But don't, we, don't you think we want to be a family whereby when folks look at us, they get hope. They get encouragement. They don't get discouraged. They say, wow, they really function well together. Mm -hmm. They love each other. And they watch you from afar. And they look at how you do business. And it becomes an example that they can follow. And that's what this home is about, this series. Being those examples, those godly examples, because what we have going on in the world today, 
This is not God's example. It's selfish example. As I said, it's my thing. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I ain't going to tell you. I ain't going to say the rest. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. And it says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Let's, let's help them to become light. It doesn't have to say it necessarily. Remember we had the, um, the series that we call Necessary. Remember, use words if necessary. We're an example at all times, or we should be witnessing at all times. And when necessary, use words. So our actions, how we conduct ourselves, how we conduct our lives, should be showing how to do this. And now, I wanted to look at this and kind of wrap our mind around it. Verse number 18. Well, let's look at 17. It says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And then in 60 it says, we got to redeem the time because we know the days are evil. We, that means don't, don't say I'll do it tomorrow. Do it when and how and while you can. As I said earlier, we had some friends that perished in a plane crash. Very, they were going from ages of 57 years old to 25 years old. And I don't think on that day they thought that that was their last day. So redeem the time while you can redeem the time. And don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of God is. The will of God, number one, is that everyone will come to a relationship with who he is through his son, Jesus Christ. And then this is one of my favorite scriptures for a different reason, but... And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now let's talk about this. Uh, I know what it's like to be a drinker. I was raised up with one. I was one for a little bit, but... I decided to stop. But one thing, when a drunk get drunk, they always like to sing off key. <laughs> Even when they can't sing, they just uh, they they just happy. But and so what Paul is bringing out in this, he says, don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, because you usually have to drink a lot of wine or a lot of spirits, as they call it, liquor, in order to get into this mood that he's setting this up. He says, but be filled with the spirit. In the same manner that you would try to be filled with this ingesting this liquid. He says, speaking to yourselves in psalms, singing songs to yourselves, singing hymns to yourself, and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Have you ever just thought about a song and worshiping God, driving in your car, or, or, or you have one of them crazy days at work and a song just comes yeah. to your mind. Yeah. And you start singing singing that song to yourself. And next thing you know, it's time to be off work. <laughs> and you'd be like, wow, this day just went right by. But when you first got in there, it wasn't, it wasn't going too well. But as you begin to make melody in your heart, praising and magnifying God, it's like he comes in and just kind of sets around you that hedge. That all that stuff that was coming at you mm -hmm. doesn't penetrate. Go ahead. You just sit there and you just resting in God. Mm -hmm. Doing what you got to do, Amen. but your mind and your spirit is just worshiping and magnifying the power of a song. Yes. A song shakes people. We have seen situations where uh, folks have sung and caused other folks to faint. We've seen people sing songs and cause tears just to stream down 
other folks' eyes. The power of a song. But the, the biggest point I want to be bring out of this part is the what we're doing is in verse number 20 it says, giving thanks always for all things, for all things mm -hmm. unto God and the Father mm -hmm. in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks only when I feel like it. Always. Just for the good thing. All things. Always. All things. Unto God, who's the author and the finisher of our faith, who helps us to understand our hard-haired son and our big-mouthed daughter. Twelve years old, going on fifty. But as we begin to just worship God, and God starts giving us wisdom and how to communicate. And as he starts giving you that wisdom how to communicate, the kids be looking at you like, well, last week I did this. I made you mad, so you left me alone. Now you're going to sit in here and keep talking to me? Okay, now i got to try to think of something different. Because if I make you mad, you're going to talk to me, and then I don't have to change. I can keep doing what I'm doing. But as God starts leading you, because you got this melody in your heart, you got this communication thing going on. And everything that they try to do to confuse the situation, the light of God just starts permeating the room. Remember I said in the beginning, a godly family does not necessarily mean that everybody in the family is living a godly life. But it means they have a respect. Right. It means that they have a love. It means that they, how they do business is a little bit different than everyone else. And what generates out of that situation is that they begin to become come to a realization and accepting Christ in their life. Because it's not forced down their throat. Because rules without relationship breeds rebellion. So what I want, I want to close with, 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 with this uh, sticky note. Y'all know that. I got a little sticky note I want to, want to throw on you. And the sticky note for this week is this. It says, your family is a basic part of your witness to the community. Your family is a basic part of your witness to the community. Your family is a basic part of your witness to the community. Guess what? Your family is a basic part of your witness to the community. You know what? Your family is a basic part of your witness to the community. Just give me a couple more seconds, and I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and let you, let you go. But I, I, I need to I need to emphasize this. It doesn't matter how folks look at your family. It doesn't matter. But it's what they know about your family that becomes significant. If they say, you know, them pinners are some crazy people. But I tell you what. They love them some Jesus. Even the ones that's in jail, they still love Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. Folks can look at your family and say, instead of saying, yeah, that's, that's where all the drug dealers live. That, that's your last name? You a drug dealer? But they say, you know what, y'all? Man, your, your cousin used to come preach to me when I was working on the street. You know, you want to have that environment whereby folks know that your family has a godly mentality. That godly mentality will perpetuate to cause folks around them to live a godly life. Why? Because we already said, because light dispels the darkness. 
So your family is a basic part of your witness to the community. I gotta say it one more time. Your family is a basic part of your witness to the community. And that doesn't mean that your family is gonna be perfect. But that means your family understands that whatever they need is found in Jesus. Isn't that funny? I don't want, I don't want to be a Christian. But when I get in trouble, I say, oh God. Mm -hmm. I say, oh Jesus. Mm -hmm. I get on the phone, I say, Mama, pray for me. I don't want, don't, I don't want to believe, but I do know that there's power in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you now for just moving us from the basic unit of the husband and wife to now discussing the effects that the family has in the community. How someone's always watching us. As you said to your Apostle Paul, that we're living epistles that are read of all men. Letters that are written on by the actions, by our actions. So Father, we ask for your wisdom even now and how we even interact with our children today, even though they may be gone and out of the house or have just been born. Give us wisdom. That when we establish rules, we'll establish a relationship and that will breed righteousness. And that you will be exalted and that people will know that our families serve only you. So, Father, we thank you and honor you for this day. We thank you for an opportunity to talk again about the family. Give us wisdom now in your son Jesus' name.